Plutarchs, Isis, and Osiris. This work is, of course, in the public domain. It is here presented in abridged form, my intention in doing so being to give the author's account of the story of Isis and Osiris, which captures the universally heroic spirit of Isis, as well as to exclude much but not all of the author's digressions into Greek mythology, and at times only faintly relevant musings. Also excluded are his proven inaccuracies in attempting to attribute Greek roots to many Egyptian words. Keep in mind, too, that mentions of Hermes are to be associated with the Egyptian Toth, or Tahuti. Mentions of Typhon are to be associated with the Egyptian Set, and that the Egyptian place name of Chemia is to be associated with its derivative, Alchemy. Also omitted are his direct addresses to Clea, the Delphic priestess to whom he dedicates the work. Intact, however, is the story inherent in the promise of its title. We begin. All good things sensible men must ask from the gods, and especially do we pray that from those mighty gods we may, in our quest, gain a knowledge of themselves, so far as such a thing is attainable by men. For we believe that there is nothing more important for man to receive or more ennobling for God of his grace to grant than the truth. God gives to men the other things for which they express a desire, but of sense and intelligence he grants them only a share inasmuch as these are his especial possessions and his sphere of activity. For the deity is not blessed by reason of his possession of gold and silver, nor strong because of thunder and lightning, but through knowledge and intelligence. Of all the things that Homer said about the gods, he has expressed most beautifully this thought. Both indeed were in lineage one and of the same country, yet was Zeus the earlier born, and his knowledge was greater. Thereby the poet plainly declares that the primacy of Zeus is nobler, since it is elder in knowledge and in wisdom. I think also that a source of happiness in the eternal life, which is the lot of God, is that events which come to pass do not escape his prescience. But if his knowledge and meditation on the nature of existence should be taken away, then to my mind his immortality is not living, but a mere lapse of time. Therefore, the effort to arrive at the truth, and especially the truth about the gods, is a longing for the divine. For the search for truth requires for its study and investigation the consideration of sacred subjects, and it is a work more hallowed than any form of holy living or temple service. And not least of all, it is well-pleasing to the goddess whom you worship, a goddess exceptionally wise and a lover of wisdom to whom, as her name at least seems to indicate, knowledge and understanding are in the highest degree appropriate. Typhon tears to pieces and scatters to the winds the sacred writings, which the goddess collects and puts together and gives into the keeping of those that are initiated into the holy rites, since this consecration, by a strict regimen and by abstinence from many kinds of food and from the lusts of the flesh, curtails licentiousness and the love of pleasure and induces a habit of patient submission to the stern and rigorous services in shrines, the end and aim of which is the knowledge of him who is the first, the Lord of all, the ideal one. Him does the God urge us to seek, since he is near her and with her and in close communion. The name of her shrine also clearly promises knowledge and comprehension of reality, for it is named Isian to indicate that we shall comprehend reality if in a reasonable and devout frame of mind we pass within the portals of her shrines. Moreover, many writers have held her to be the daughter of Hermes, and many others the daughter of Prometheus because of the belief that Prometheus is the discoverer of wisdom and forethought, and Hermes the inventor of grammar and music. 
For this reason, they call the first of the Muses at Hermopolis Isis as well as Justice, for she is wise, as I have said, and discloses the divine mysteries to those who truly and justly have the name of bearers of the sacred vessels and wearers of the sacred robes. These are they who, within their own soul, as though within a casket, bear the sacred writings about the gods, clear of all superstition and pedantry, and they cloak them with secrecy, thus giving intimation, some dark and shadowy, some clear and bright, of their concepts about the gods, intimations of the same sort as are clearly evidenced in the wearing of the sacred garb. For this reason, too, the fact that the deceased votaries of Isis are decked with these garments is a sign that these sacred writings accompany them, and that they pass to the other world possessed of these and of naught else. It is a fact that having a beard and wearing a coarse cloak does not make philosophers, nor does dressing in linen and shaving the hair make votaries of Isis. But the true votary of Isis is he who, when he has legitimately received what is set forth in the ceremonies connected with these gods, uses reason in investigating and in studying the truth contained therein. Inside the statue of Athena, whom they believe to be Isis, bore the inscription, I am all that has been, and is, and shall be, and my robe no mortal has yet uncovered. Here follows the story related in the briefest possible words with the omission of everything that is merely unprofitable or superfluous. They say that the son, when he became aware of Rhea's intercourse with Cronus, invoked a curse upon her that she should not give birth to a child in any month or year. But Hermes, being enamored of the goddess, consorted with her. Later, playing at draughts with the moon, he won from her the seventieth part of each of her periods of illumination, and from all the winnings he composed five days, and intercalated them as an addition to the three hundred and sixty days. The Egyptians even now call these five days intercalated, and celebrate them as the birthdays of the gods. They relate that on the first of these days Osiris was born, and at the hour of his birth a voice issued forth, saying, the Lord of all advances to the light. But some relate that a certain Pamelis, while he was drawing water in Thebes, heard a voice issuing from the shrine of Zeus, which bade him proclaim with a loud voice that a mighty and beneficent king, Osiris, had been born. And for this, Cronus entrusted to him the child Osiris, which he brought up. It is in his honor that the festival of Pamelia is celebrated a festival which resembles the phallic processions. On the second of these days, Araris was born, whom they call Apollo, and some call him also the elder Horus. On the third day, Typhon was born, but not in due season or manner, but with a blow he broke through his mother's side and leaped forth. On the fourth day, Isis was born, in the regions that are ever moist, and on the fifth, Neptis, whom they gave the name of Finality and the name of Aphrodite, and some also the name of Victory. There is also a tradition that Osiris and Araris were sprung from the sun, Isis from Hermes, and Typhon and Neptus from Cronus. For this reason, the kings considered the third of the intercalated days as inauspicious and transacted no business on that day nor did they give any attention to their bodies until nightfall. They relate, moreover, that Neptis became the wife of Typhon. But Isis and Osiris were enamored of each other and consorted together in the darkness of the womb before their birth. Some say that Araris came from this union and was called the Elder Horus by the Egyptians, but Apollo by the Greeks. One of the first acts related of Osiris in his reign was to deliver the Egyptians from their destitute and brutish manner of living. This he did by showing them the fruits of cultivation, by giving them laws, and by teaching them to honor the gods. Later he traveled over the whole earth, civilizing it without the slightest need of arms, but most of the peoples he won over to his way by the charm of his persuasive discourse combined with song and all manner of music. Hence the Greeks came to identify him with Dionysus. During his absence, the tradition is that Typhon attempted nothing revolutionary because Isis, who was in control, was vigilant and alert. 
But when he returned home, Typhon contrived a treacherous plot against him and formed a group of conspirators at 72 in number. He had also the cooperation of a queen from Ethiopia who was there at the time and whose name they report as Asso. Typhon, having secretly measured Osiris's body and having made ready a beautiful chest of corresponding size, artistically ornamented, caused it to be brought into the room where the festivity was in progress. The company was much pleased at the sight of it and admired it greatly, whereupon Typhon jestingly promised to present it to the man who should find the chest to be exactly his length when he laid down in it. They all tried it in turn, but no one fitted it. Then Osiris got into it and lay down, and those who were in the plot ran to it and slammed down the lid, which they fastened by nails from the outside and also by using molten lead. Then they carried the chest to the river and sent it on its way to the sea through the Tanitic mouth. Wherefore the Egyptians, even to this day, name this mouth the hateful and execrable. Such is the tradition. They say also that the date on which this deed was done was the seventeenth day of Aether, when the sun passes through Scorpion and in the twenty-eighth year of the reign of Osiris. But some say that these are the years of his life and not of his reign. The first to learn of the deed and to bring men's knowledge and account of what had been done were the pans and satyrs who lived in the region around. And so, even to this day, the sudden confusion and consternation of a crowd is called a panic. Isis, when the tidings reached her, at once cut off one of her tresses and put on a garment of mourning in a place where the city still bears the name of Copto. Others think that the name means deprivation, for they also express deprive by means of Coptin. But Isis wandered everywhere at her wit's end. No one whom she approached did she fail to address, and even when she met some little children she asked them about the chest. As it happened, they had seen it, and they told her the mouth of the river through which the friends of Typhon had launched the coffin into the sea. Wherefore the Egyptians think that little children possess the power of prophecy and they try to divine the future from the portents which they find in children's words, especially when children are playing about in holy places and crying out whatever chances to come into their minds. They relate also that Isis, learning that Osiris in his love had consorted with her sister through ignorance in the belief that she was Isis and seeing the proof of this in the garland of Melilite which she had left with Neptis, sought to find the child for the mother, immediately after its birth, had exposed it because of her fear of Typhon. And when the child had been found, after great toil and trouble, with the help of dogs which led Isis to it, it was brought up and became her guardian and attendant, receiving the name of Anubis, and it is said to protect the gods just as dogs protect men. Thereafter Isis, as they relate, learned that the chest had been cast up by the sea, near the land of Byblus, and that the waves had gently set it down in the midst of a clump of heather. The heather in a short time ran up into a very beautiful and massive stock and enfolded and embraced the chest with its growth and concealed it within its trunk. The king of the country admired the great size of the plant and cut off the portion that enfolded the chest, which was now hidden from sight, and used it as a pillar to support the roof of his house. These facts, they say, Isis ascertained by the divine inspiration of rumor, and came to Byblus and sat down by a spring, all dejection and tears. She exchanged no word with anybody, save only that she welcomed the queen's maidservants and treated them with great amiability, plaiting their hair for them, and imparting to their persons a wondrous fragrance from her own body. But when the queen observed her maidservants, a longing came upon her for the unknown woman and for such hairdressing and for a body fragrant with ambrosia. Thus it happened that Isis was sent for and became so intimate with the queen that the queen made her the nurse of her baby. They say that the king's name was Melchander. The queen's name, some say, was Astarte, others, Seusis, and still others, Nemenus, which the Greeks would call Athenai. They relate that Isis nursed the child by giving it her finger to suck instead of her breast, and in the night she would burn away the mortal portions of its body. 
she herself would turn into a swallow and flit about the pillar with a wailing lament until the queen who had been watching when she saw her babe on fire gave forth a loud cry and thus deprived it of immortality. Then the goddess disclosed herself and asked for the pillar which served to support the roof. She removed it with the greatest ease and cut away the wood of the heather which surrounded the chest. Then, when she had wrapped up the wood in a linen cloth and had poured perfume upon it, she entrusted it to the care of the kings, and even to this day the people of Byblus venerate this wood, which is preserved in the shrine of Isis. Then the goddess threw herself down upon the coffin with such a dreadful wailing that the younger of the king's sons expired on the spot. The elder son she kept with her, and having placed the coffin on board a boat, she put out from land. Since the Phaedrus River toward the early morning fostered a rather boisterous wind, the goddess grew angry and dried up its stream. In the first place where she found seclusion, when she was quite by herself, they relate that she opened the chest and laid her face upon the face within and caressed it and wept. The child came quietly up behind her and saw what was there. And when the goddess became aware of his presence, she turned about and gave him one awful look of anger. The child could not endure the fright and died. Others will not have it so, but assert that he fell overboard into the sea from the boat that was mentioned above. He also is the recipient of honors because of the goddess. For they say that the Mineros, of whom the Egyptians sing at their convivial gatherings, is this very child. Some say, however, that his name was Palestinus or Pelusius, and that the city founded by the goddess was named in his honor. They also recount that this Mineros, who is the theme of their songs, was the first to invent music. But some say that the word is not the name of any person, but an expression belonging to the vocabulary of drinking and feasting. Good luck be ours in things like this. And that this is really the idea expressed by the exclamation, Maneros, whenever the Egyptians use it. In the same way, we may be sure that the likeness of a corpse, which, as it is exhibited to them, is carried around in a chest, is not a reminder of what happened to Osiris, as some assume, but it is to urge them, as they contemplate it, to use and to enjoy the present, since all very soon must be what it is now, and this is their purpose in introducing it into the midst of merrymaking. As they relate, Isis proceeded to her son Horus, who was being reared in Buto, and bestowed the chest in a place well out of the way. But Typhon, who was hunting by night in the light of the moon, happened upon it. Recognizing the body, he divided it into fourteen parts and scattered them, each in a different place. Isis learned of this and sought for them again, sailing through the swamps in a boat of papyrus. This is the reason why people sailing in such boats are not harmed by the crocodiles, since these creatures in their own way show either fear or their reverence for the goddess. The traditional result of Osiris's dismemberment is that there are many so-called tombs of Osiris in Egypt, for Isis held a funeral for each part when she had found it. Others deny this and assert that she caused effigies of him to be made, and these she distributed among the several cities, pretending that she was giving them his body, in order that he might receive divine honors in a greater number of cities, and also that, if Typhon should succeed in overpowering Horus, he might despair of ever finding the true tomb when so many were pointed out to him, all of them called the tomb of Osiris. Of the parts of Osiris's body, the only one which Isis did not find was the male member, for the reason that this had been at once tossed into the river, and the Lepidotus, the sea bream, and the pike had fed upon it, and it is from these very fishes the Egyptians are most scrupulous in abstaining but Isis made a replica of the member to take its place and consecrated the phallus, in honor of which the Egyptians, even at the present day, celebrate a festival. Later, as they relate, Osiris came to Horus from the other world and exercised and trained him for the battle. After a time, Osiris asked Horus what he held to be the most noble of all things. When Horus replied, 
to avenge one's father and mother for evil done to them. Osiris then asked him what animal he considered the most useful for them who go forth to battle. And when Horus said, A horse! Osiris was surprised and raised the question why it was that he had not rather said a lion than a horse. Horus answered that a lion was a useful thing for a man in need of assistance, but that a horse served best for cutting off the flight of an enemy and annihilating him. When Osiris heard this, he was much pleased, since he felt that Horus had now an adequate preparation. It is said that, as many were continually transferring their allegiance to Horus, Typhon's concubine, Theris, also came over to him, and a serpent which pursued her was cut to pieces by Horus's men, and now, in memory of this, the people throw down a rope in their midst and chop it up. Now the battle, as they relate, lasted many days and Horus prevailed. Isis, however, to whom Typhon was delivered in chains, did not cause him to be put to death, but released him and let him go. Horus could not endure this with equanimity. He laid hands upon his mother and wrested the royal diadem from her head. But Hermes put upon her a helmet like unto the head of a cow. Typhon formally accused Horus of being an illegitimate child. But with the help of Hermes to plead his cause, it was decided by the gods that he also was legitimate. Typhon was then overcome in two other battles. Osiris consorted with Isis after his death, and she became the mother of Harpocrates, untimely born and weak in his lower limbs. Stories akin to these and to others like them, they say are related about Typhon how that, prompted by jealousy and hostility, he wrought terrible deeds and, by bringing utter confusion upon all things, filled the whole earth, and the ocean as well, with ills, and later paid the penalty therefor. But the avenger, the sister and wife of Osiris, after she had quenched and suppressed the madness and fury of Typhon, was not indifferent to the contests and struggles which she had endured, nor to her own wanderings, nor to her manifold deeds of wisdom and many feats of bravery, nor would she accept oblivion and silence for them, but she intermingled in the most holy rites, portrayals and suggestions and representations of her experiences at that time, and sanctified them, both as a lesson in godliness and an encouragement for men and women who find themselves in the clutch of like calamities, she herself and Osiris translated for their virtues from good demigods into gods, as were Heracles and Dionysus later, not incongruously enjoyed double honors, both those of gods and those of demigods, and their powers extend everywhere, but are greatest in the regions above the earth and beneath the earth. In fact, men assert that Pluto is none other than Serapis, and that Persephone is Isis. Even as Archimachus of Euboea has said, and also Heraclides Ponticus, who holds the oracle in Canopus to be an oracle of Pluto. But now let us begin over again, and consider first the most perspicuous of those who have a reputation for expounding matters more philosophically. These men are like the Greeks, who say that Cronus is but a figurative name for time, Hera for air, and that the birth of Hephaestus symbolizes the change of air into fire. And thus among the Egyptians, such men say that Osiris is the Nile consorting with the earth, which is Isis, and that the sea is Typhon into which the Nile discharges its waters and is lost to view and dissipated, save for that part which the earth takes up and absorbs and thereby becomes fertilized. The bull kept at Heliopolis and which is sacred to Osiris, some hold it to be the sire of Apis is black and has honors second only to Apis. Egypt, moreover, which has the blackest of soils, they call by the same name as the black portion of the eye, Chemia, and compare it to a heart, for it is warm and moist and is enclosed by the southern portions of the inhabited world and adjoins them like the heart in a man's left side. Let this then be stated incidentally as a matter of record that is common knowledge, but the wiser of the priests call not only the Nile Osiris and the sea Typhon, 
but they simply give the name of Osiris to the whole source and faculty creative of moisture, believing this to be the cause of generation and the substance of life-producing seed and the name of Typhon they give to all that is dry, fiery, and arid, in general, and antagonistic to moisture. They say that the sun and moon do not use chariots, but boats in which to sail round in their courses, and by this they intimate that the nourishment and origin of these heavenly bodies is from moisture. They think also that Homer, like Talus, had gained his knowledge from the Egyptians, when he postulated water as the source and origin of all things. For, according to them, Oceanus is Osiris, and Tethys is Isis, since she is the kindly nurse and provider for all things. Not only the Nile, but every form of moisture they call simply the effusion of Osiris, and in their holy rites the water jar in honor of the god heads the procession, and by the picture of a rush they represent a king in the southern region of the world, and the rush is interpreted to mean the watering and fructifying of all things, and in its nature it seems to bear some resemblance to the generative member. Moreover, when they celebrate the festival of the Pamilia, which has, as has been said, is of a phallic member, they expose and carry about a statue of which the male member is triple, for the god is the source, and every source, by its fecundity, multiplies what proceeds from it. And for many times, we have a habit of saying thrice. As, for example, thrice happy, and bonds, even thrice as many, unnumbered. Unless, indeed, the word triple is used by the early writers in its strict meaning. For the nature of moisture being the source and origin of all things created out of itself three primal material substances, earth, air, and fire. In fact, the tale that is annexed to the legend to the effect that Typhon cast the male member of Osiris into the river, and Isis could not find it, but constructed and shaped a replica of it, and ordained that it should be honored and borne in processions plainly comes round to this doctrine that the creative and germinal power of the god at the very first acquired moisture as its substance and through moisture combined with whatever was by nature capable of participating in generation.